All right, let's go and discuss the microanatomy of the nervous system. That's the, the small parts of the nervous system. So we'll talk a lot about the neurons, the cells, and what they're made up of. We have two main cell types inside the nervous system. We have nerve cells, the neurons. Those are the main cells, so to speak. They are responsible to receive a stimulus, to process a stimulus, and to conduct an impulse. And then we have neuroglia cells, or simply said glia cells, and glia means glue, and those are supporting cells that help the neurons with nutrients and physical support. Some of them are part of the immune system, so they help with the defenses, and others are helping the nerve um, extension, the processes, be wrapped in fat, so we have an insulation around this wire that conducts an impulse. We briefly mentioned that in the last chapter when we talked about the conduction speed and we said there's this, this uh, fat layer, this myelin sheath that surrounds an axon and has little gaps and so the speed of the transmission is greatly improved. Those are glial cells that do that and help with that. In opposition to the neurons, the glial cells will divide through life. And I will caveat, not all neurons do not divide and reproduce throughout life. We have found that some, especially the memory cells, the ones where we create memory, the hippocampal cells they are, they will reproduce depending on many factors, of course. Um, but most of them don't. And when they die or when they have yeah, disease or lack of oxygen or an injury, they will be replaced the neurons will be replaced by glia cells. The neuron. They are structurally and functionally independent units. So when we study the nervous system, we can study one neuron to start with, to understand how the whole thing works on a fundamental basis. We got about 20 to 50 billion neurons inside the brain. That's a lot of them. But we have trillions of cells inside the body. So very often, I talk to a patient, I ask them, <clears throat> uh, you know, you're not just your brain, you're also your body. So let's take care of the whole structure and not just the brain. Because most of us just kind of live in the brain very often. Um, neurons connect to other cells because they got to transmit an impulse, so they got to talk to, they communicate. And when they connect, they connect either to muscles, so they stimulate a muscle, they connect to glands, so they stimulate a gland to release some hormones, <clears throat> or they also connect to other neurons. And they connect to those um, structures via a junction called a synapse. And we're going to talk about that synapse in a moment. When we look at the size and the shape of neurons, they vary very, very greatly. We have both the smallest cell inside the brain, but we also have the largest cell inside the brain, and they're both neurons. Let's look at a basic structure of a neuron. We basically have three parts, and the way we look at them is in a way of a direction of an impulse. So the first thing we have is we have these extensions coming off a cell body that are called dendrites. There are about up to a thousand of these branching processes. They are fingers like antennas that receive stimuli from other neurons. And then they take that stimulus and transmit it to the cell body, which is the second main structure. The soma, in neurology we call that the soma or the pericarion. And that is the metabolic center. That's the place where we make uh, energy, where we make um, uh, neurotransmitters, for example. So all that machinery is there. And then off of that body comes a long, long extension. It originates at a narrow base at the cell body, and that is the axon. That's a, an extension that could project about 100 centimeter uh, forward. 100 centimeter is about half of your body height, or more than half of most of our body height. Um, and they are the wires, so to speak, that conduct an impulse to the next receptor organ. Again, that's a neuron, a muscle, or a gland. 
they very um, often have side branches and the side branches will be called collaterals. The place at the body, the cell body, uh, where the axon starts, that's the axon hillock. Because when we remember back to the old chapter, when we look at the nerve impulse, we have all these small voices that come from the dendrites that are, that are either stimulating uh, uh, impulses or, or inhibiting impulses. And depending on how much the, um, ultimately it's a voltage change, how much that voltage changes at the axon hillock, that's the determining site where the cell, where that neuron says, okay, let's fire an impulse or let's not fire an impulse. We look at the classification of neurons. We can do that, for example, here what we do, we look at how many processes, how many axons, how many dendrites come out of the cell body. And the most numerous neuron is the one we just described, where we have many, many dendrites, one cell body, and then one large axon. And that's called the multipolar neuron. It's the most numerous types, and it's the main neuron in the central nervous system. The CNS, remember, is the brain and the spinal cord. And then we have neurons that are bipolar. And that bi means two, and polar means the poles on a cell body, so that uh, a neuron that has one long extension on one side and another long extension on the other side. One of them is the axon, uh, is the, sorry, the dendrite, and then the other is the axon. These are very, very rare, and we only find them in the nose and in the eye. They are receiving neurons that help us um, hear and see. That's the only place where we have them left. Because when we look at most neurons that are receiving sensory neurons, um, when they come from the body, they have made themselves into what we call pseudo-unipolar neurons. They originate from a bipolar neuron, but the axon and the dendrite merge together close to the body, and the body moves away from that now one long extension. These are neurons we find outside of the central nervous system. And the reason why they are created is because in the cent inside the central nervous system we have the brain and the, I mean we have the skull and we have the vertebral column that really protects uh, the neurons greatly. Outside of those uh, protected areas, there is a lot of danger happening. And so these sensory nerves, these sensory neurons, what they've done is they have moved, moved the cell bodies away from these projections. And, 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 and made clusters of cell bodies and basically say, we are better in greater numbers. We are less exposed, we are stronger, so therefore we better do that to protect ourselves. Of course, they didn't talk to each other, but that's what nature's done. And uh, then we go to the spinal cord, we have one little bulge, we talked about that in lab already, we have a, a little place, a bulge where the nerve gets a little bigger. And that's an area in the sensory nerve where all those cell bodies lie. And so a pseudo-unipolar neuron is just a long, long extension and a cell body somewhere off that long extension. Good, look, that brings us to the neuron to neuron or neuron to muscle or neuron to gland connection, the synapse. So once we have an action potential going down an axon and it goes and it reaches its end, we have to communicate to the next part party uh, of what to do. And we do that via a synapse transmission to the next neuron or the next the recipient, basically. In most cases, uh, we have a nerve stimulus that goes to the end of a nerve a, 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 an electrical nerve stimulus and then at the end of that nerve we actually have a chemical that is released to then communicate to the next neuron. So a chemical agent called a neurotransmitter will deliver a message from one neuron to the next neuron, to a muscle or to a gland. And we have many 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 different types of neurotransmitters, many different chemicals. We have acetylcholine, we have glutamate, we have GABA, we have norepinephrine, serotonin, endorphins, and so forth. Some of them you might have heard. 
Some of them are completely foreign. And these chemicals, they, they're going to they're gonna talk to the, next, to the recipients, and the recipients has re receiving ends that will take those chemicals and then have an action formed at the other side. Either the action is usually either a stimulating action or an inhibiting action. So let's look at the look at it a little more closely. When we look at the synapse, we have three parts. We have a presynaptic area, that's a presynaptic membrane. That's the nerve that brings the stimulus down to its end. And then we have a space, we have a synaptic cleft, an intercellular gap that is not that those two don't touch. So there's a space, a physical space in there. And at the other end of that gap, we have a postsynaptic membrane. Remember, pre means before and post means after. I always remember that because when I look at the post office, I never have the post office deliver a letter before I've written it. I first have to write it, so it's after I write the letter. So the post means after. 